Thank you all for being here today. Uh, I'm going to talk today about cross-shelf processes and the role of mesoscale dynamics in regional connectivity in the Gulf of Mexico. So this is various parts of work that I've been doing in the past few months in collaboration with people who are mostly interested in biological processes. And so that's why I mean I have a list of collaborators who are people here from the modeling group, Vili, George, Hisu, Piani, also people I work with in the Restore project, Frank Miller-Carger at USF, Luke McEachron at FWC, and Dan Otis, Kim Johnson from Fisheries gave, gave me, helped me also with data as well as Sean Min, Ryan here at AOML of course, and, uh, and John Lamkin's lab with uh, Katie and Leaf and, and others. So, um, the background is this, the Gulf of Mexico, so it's a very active place in terms of dynamics and also ecosystems. So here I'm showing a map of the Gulf bathymetry with the wide shelf, on West Florida shelf and Campeche Bank. And um, I also included the location of marine protected areas in the region. So you see um, uh, Cabo San Antonio and Guanaja Cabibes. We have the RMPAs along the uh, Yucatan Channel in Mexico and also down in the Florida Keys, there's flower garden banks here. So we see that most of these MPAs are in the vicinity of the loop current system. So the loop current system is this current that flows from the Yucatan Channel and exits through the Florida Straits that has variable extension from a very retracted one from um, Yucatan Channel straight to the Florida Straits. And within a few months, the loop current extends, reaches the northern gulf, and then finally sheds a large anticyclinic eddy that then drifts westward. So we see that depending on the extension of the loop current, it potentially can connect some of the, of the MPAs in the region, and that's what we, we're interested in. So the connectivity within an MPA can be influenced by mesoscale dynamics, typically like around the Florida Keys between Pule Ridge and, and uh, and the Florida Keys. So that this has been studied by um, Sue Sponagel, for example, or Katie Shuzitsky here. And, um, but also the mesoscale dynamics can uh, affect connectivity at the regional scale because it modifies, it, can, it has the potential of modifying the loop current pathway itself, like the meandering of the current and associated processes. So this is the, yeah, the playground of this, the, the, um, the interaction of the physical and biological processes that I am interested in. And I'm going to present today a few examples of um, um, cross-shelf processes that are connected, that are related to regional connectivity. First one is with an extended loop current and an episode of uh, export of Mississippi River waters um, uh, offshore and down to the Florida Straits. A second example with, will be the, um, in the case of retracted loop current, what what can be the connectivity patterns in the Yucatan Channel Florida Straits region. And the last example, which is a little away from the loop current, but another like relevant example of, of uh, shelf processes in the Flower Garden Banks National Marine, Marine Sanctuary. So the first uh, example is an example of distance con distant connectivity between um, the Mississippi Delta and the Florida Straits. Uh, it happened in summer 2014. And we see here ocean color imagery, and we see initially in July 2014 there was two there were two branches of high chlorophyll uh, waters originating from the Mississippi River that extended eastward and then merging and extending southward along the the edge of the West Florida Shelf, and we see that this pathway is a little away from the main loop current, which is here, and here we have a detached loop current eddy that is pushing waters eastward as well. And later on in August, these um, river waters keep extending southward along the, the West Florida Shelf edge, and it's only there that they finally go offshore and are entering along the loop current. So that's pretty unusual pathway. And we see, I'm oh, sorry, we see here the, the role of a, a loop current frontal eddy, cyclonic eddy at the edge of the loop current that managed to advect some of the waters uh, towards the shelf and on, on the shelf. And another uh, um, original aspect, unusual aspect of this event is that there was no flood of the Mississippi River that year. So this is the river discharge in red here, very close to the climatology in black solid line, but very different from a typical flood year here 
in dashed lines. So this, those results are presented last year and they, are, they have been published since. But then in the following summer, summer 2015, there was another uh, episode of, of Mississippi River water, waters being uh, uh, abducted towards the Florida Straits. So initially the water spread eastward like the 2014 case and we see that early on there's a first filament of uh, higher chlorophyll value reaching the, the Florida Straits here and later on in August we see a very large patch here of river waters this time directly following the edge of the loop current and later in August we see this typical signature of a large uh, loop current frontal eddy, cyclonic eddy at the edge of the current that this time is trapping um, material and preventing it from reaching the Florida Straits. And this event is also more usual with the uh, large value of uh, river discharge in July and August that are associated with this very strong signature along the loop current. So the discharge and the pathway are more usual for this type of, of uh, export processes. So we have been uh, implementing um, uh, our model to study this, these events. So it's a, a high resolution, two kilometer HICOM that is um, uh, nested in the operational uh, global HICOM and uses uh, improved river physics and realistic daily river forcing to really represent the, the processes I just mentioned. It also includes data assimilation with the, for now, um, altimetry and sea surface temperature and this uh, configuration is also set up in near real time, which means that it provides daily analysis and seven day forecast once a week. And it's uh, on this, this website that's part of the uh, modeling group that we have here between uh, AOML and, and Rasmus. So um, this is the result from the model in 2015, the last case I just presented. So in color are the salinity, this is the salinity with blue uh, for low salinity, typical of river waters and the white contours are the uh, sea surface height, so the closed solid contours are associated with anti-cyclonic um, pattern, and the dashed contours are associated with the frontal cyclonic eddy, like here we cannot see it very well. But what I wanted to point out is that the model is able to represent the early advection of the, the riverine waters filament towards the Florida Straits that, as it was observed, and we also see this very marked tongue of uh, river waters that really match, uh, this pattern really matches what is observed and we are able to have it in the model and we also finally see the, the effect of this, this frontal eddy in, in capturing, in, in um, catching some of the, of the river waters. So the model does, does a, quite a good job in representing the, the, the observed processes. On the opposite, this is uh, from existing operational model and um, the Gulf uh, four kilometer resolution that is run by the Navy and that doesn't have the, the specific river representation. And we see that the, the signature in salinity is, is not as good because we have low salinity waters that go that are present in the core of the loop current, which is not what is observed. So our tool, our modeling tool is really efficient in representing the, the Mississippi River export pathway. And what are the consequences down the Florida Straits in the Florida Keys? So these are data from a, a research cruise that took place in summer 2014. And the cruise was going to pull a ridge here. So on the way, and this is the surface salinity that was met by the, the Walton Smith. And on the way back, during most of the cruise and on the way back, this is the salinity that they found. And we see a very, very marked drop in surface salinity that is associated with the arrival of this riverine waters on the shelf. And this, uh, on the vertical, this is vertical section in temperature, in salinity, we see that the surface low salinity river waters is 10 to 20 meter thick. So it means that these very large quantities of waters that are advected really far down, um, down the Gulf of Mexico and in the, in the Florida Keys, and that's the potential of transporting material, not only nutrients, but also maybe pollutant or other other materials. So this is uh, um, yeah, quite important for the Florida Keys and we don't really know to what extent it affects the area. But this type of process is typically associated with an extended loop current and um, 
or at least the loop current eddy that is able to to attract and advect the, this material and down southward the Gulf of Mexico. So now I'm going to talk about a case of retracted loop current. So for this this part, I'm going to present um, uh, results from the research cruise that was organized by the, the fisheries across the street to sample bluefin tuna larvae. And it's the, I took part to the first leg of the cruise, which left from Miami, went to Havana, and then the leg one was from Havana down to Cozumel. And we were interested in sampling mesoscale features because we know that they can modulate and affect the presence and growth of fish larvae. So that's something that uh, Ricardo has shown and Katie has worked on as well. So I'm going to present the sampling of a deep gulf mesoscale feature that we encountered here. And also I'm going to present um, more near coastal processes that we were lucky to sample along Cuba and along Campeche Bank. There were other processes here that I'm not going to talk about. So uh, what was the situation of the Gulf before we, we left? So that's, those are uh, images of ocean color, and chlorophyll A, and I, I also, uh, the contours are data from altimetry. So again, um, uh, this time dashed lines are uh, anti-cyclonic circulation, and solid line are cyclonic circulation. So in April, we see initially a large meander on the east side of the loop current, and very rapidly, uh, a couple of weeks later, there's a, a very marked cyclonic eddy forming along Campeche Bank, and they both merge at the end of April, so that it forms a very, very large loop current frontal eddy, which is on by size almost comparable to the loop current anticyclonic eddy. So that's very unusual. So this, were, this was a few days before we left Miami, so I let you imagine how excited I was to be <laughs> on the water at that moment. And also interesting, interesting uh, thing that we see on these images is the filaments of high chlorophyll A that are escaping the Campeche bank and following the edge of the loop current and the frontal eddy. And we see them here. They are very marked and, and following the pathway down to the Florida Strait. And so a few days later, we see them also this time they are circling around the loop current frontal eddy. And so this was the situation just before we started sampling this guy. So we were lucky enough to be in the core of the eddy and, and to, to uh, deploy three drifters at the core of the eddy. And we see that while we were doing that, the, the frontal cyclone changed shape quite rapidly. So it's, you cannot see with the contours, but the color we see here is very round, and here it's very elong elongated here, like a bean shape maybe. And we see that the altimetry is off, like it keeps on the same day, it keeps saying that it's round, whereas the ocean color says that it's elongated. So altimetry, it just samples one track every few days, so it interpolates in between the tracks. So that means that this frontal eddy has changed shape very rapidly because altimetry was not able to capture it. So well, yeah, it was a very exciting moment to be on the water because we really had no clue what that eddy would do. But then it's, it's stabilized in a near round shape later in May. And um, so the, the eddies were able to sample that, the drifters were able, able to sample that. And we see continuously uh, patches of high chlorophyll leaving the, leaving the Campeche Bank and being advected and, and going towards the, the West Florida Shelf and the Florida Strait. So that's, um, that day was pretty much the, the end of leg one. So those, these are the situations that we, we encountered when we were at sea. And we were also able to, uh, to do, do CTD cast uh, at the, in, in that eddy. So this is, these are the points along which we sample the, the frontal eddy, which was centered around here. And we see that it has typical, we see that the CTD uh, were able to capture typical signature of uh, loop current waters at the edge with a deep thermocline and also the presence of uh, subsurface salinity maximum at 100, 200 meters here, which is very well pronounced. And in the center is uh, typical gulf waters that don't show this uh, uh, subsurface salinity maximum. 
But one more, more importantly, we see the showing of the isotherm uh, at the core of the eddy associated with the upwelling and of the of the cyclonic circulation, and this signature was visible down to 1,200 meters, which is the deepest recorded. Most of the observations so far from for frontal eddies were down to 900, 1,000 meters, and here we show that it has a deep a signature that deep, which means that its signature is deeper than the loop current, which is felt down to 1,000 meters. Uh, uh, approximately. So these were like yeah, these those were new new data on, on this type of, of processes. So after we we left the area uh, in June and July, we were able to follow the that that frontal eddy thanks to the drifters and to ocean color. So we see that um, in June the drifters start diverging. Some of them are going on shore, and this one is going to the north. We see that the loop current frontal eddy keep changing shape and being elongated and reshaping quite a, yeah, um, very regularly. So one of the drifters was advected, did made an excursion on the West Florida shelf. So the limit of the shelf is here, and we see it entering here and leaving. Sorry, a few days later, following um, um, uh, a pattern seen on ocean color as well as, as altimetry. Uh, later on, this one is advected on the outer edge of the of the frontal eddy and is leaving the area, going eastward with uh, with the loop current anticyclonic eddy. What is interesting is the the last drifter that stayed in the in the eddy and it keep swirling around and changing the center of its rotation, keep changing and following the changing of the shape of the of the frontal eddy. So we see really here that is swirling around and and its core follows what we see in altimetry, what is located at the center of, of the frontal eddy. But finally, uh, at the end of August, that drifter was quickly advected, shoot out to the north and where was advected on the West Florida shelf, and we lost it. But we've had a few weeks of, of measurements inside the eddy. So in August, September, there was an, another strong um, cyclonic eddy that formed along the Campeche bank. But in general, there is a really disorganization. The, the, this area loses its, um, its structure, and we see um, several poles of, um, um, of cyclonic uh, features contour that form a, a, just a, like a large area of disorganized uh, positive vorticity. And what is permanent during that, that process is the, the presence of filaments of high chlorophyll leaving Campeche Bank and being advected to the, to the straits. And those are the last yeah, few snaps, uh, snapshots from a few weeks ago. And the loop current is still retracted and blocked by this very large uh, patch of cyclonic vorticity. So the loop current has been retracted because of this uh, large frontal eddy. And the loop current has been retracted since mid-April. So it's been over six months that the loop current is at the very uh, retracted position, very southward position. And this configuration favors the direct advection we see even here, like uh, patterns of higher chlorophyll content that keeps uh, being advected away from Campeche Bank down to the straits. So this is a very unusual configuration for the for the straits, and that has last. It's unusual for, by its duration and also by the season because usually the loop current is extended in summer, but this year not, and this has been shooting material to the straits for that long. So if we focus on, on this type of processes, the filaments that we see here, so this is a snapshot from um, about the day that we sampled the, this area. So this is the, the, the area, the, the location of the CTD cast that I showed earlier, and we see that we were able to sample part of that filament. So we see in temperature it's associated with a, a shoaling. So this is the, the whole north-south vertical section in temperature and the zoom in that area close to the, the filament. We see a showing in temperature in the upper 50 meters and also in fluorescence we see a typical signal, uh, a layer of, of more intense fluorescence that is really different from the, from, the, uh, from the waters in the vicinity. So this is a typical signature of this filament that is being advected away and that we were able to sample. And also, if we look in more details at ocean color imagery, so this is the actual images that I use, but I, 
I'm using this one. I don't have to add the bathymetry or the altimetry data, so I'm using the, the original data here, and we see that this, the filament that we see is uh, directly, one, one part is directly uh, dragged away from the Campici bank, but also the signature in high uh, chlorophyll is associated with some mesoscale, uh, with instabilities and some mesoscale features that are uh, formed uh, at the wake of Cozumel Island when the loop current, the Yucatan current is flowing in, we see this, uh, this trail downstream the island that is associated with, uh, with high chlorophyll content. So what we see, the patches that we see following the edge of the loop current are formed not only from directly from Campeche Bank but also because of the wake of, the, of Cozumel Island. And if we look at our near real time high resolution model with data assimilation, we see that it's capable of, of um, producing similar patterns. So this is a relative vorticity uh, estimated from a, a model snapshot. So we see the fi a filament here coming from Campeche Bank that is uh, well located compared to uh, observation. But we also see the signature of the island wake in terms of uh, vorticity filament that shape in small sub mesoscale structure that are quite comparable in size and location uh, to what, what we observe. So I think this is uh, encouraging. So if we consider this, um, this episode of export from either Mississippi River or the Campeche Bank, um, we are now, I'm working with colleagues at uh, USF and uh, FWC as part of our restore project funded by NOAA and we want to characterize those, those um, features. We, want to, we are using long data sets of, uh, of remote sensing ocean color data to isolate the episodes that I mentioned from either export from Mississippi origin or from Campeche Bank origin. And this is the type of graph that we have. So going back to 1998, those are the monthly counts of episodes of either uh, long distance Mississippi uh, River water export in red or long distance Campeche Bank water export in blue. And we see that they tend to be seasonal. Now there's peak um, almost year, yeah, every year almost. And also there are, there's a very large uh, interannual variability. So we are currently working on characterizing those events and, and um, because we're interested in, in, um, in knowing what is the impact of these exports down to the Florida Keys. So this is work in progress. And now I'm going to focus on the sampling that we did during the same cruise along the Cuban coast. So first, uh, along northern Cuba, so this is Havana, and we did we departed from here, and this is the area that we sampled. In red is the near surface current that we encountered. So I'm zooming in here, and we see a very complex circulation with, yeah with the current going pretty much everywhere. And on one of the, of the transect, north-south transect, we, this is the vertical section of offshore velocity. So positive is offshore direction, negative is onshore. And we see close to the shore a cell that, that, is, uh, that, that is typical of, of uh, upwelling with our, um, offshore current at the surface and onshore current below the surface. And this is uh, expected because there are um, the winds over there are favorable for upwelling, and we see filaments like that in ocean color very often uh, on ocean color imagery. So we again we were able to use our model to yeah, to try to understand these processes. So this is again a, a snapshot of uh, surface relative vorticity, in, but in the same area, and we see. Um, the presence of a filament of cyclonic vorticity really close to a patch of, uh, of um, anti-cyclonic vorticity to the right. And this, the, by the shape and by the size, it's really similar to the, to, to the features that we encountered in, in, um, when, while we were sampling there. And, and this uh, model, um, the relative vorticity by the model allows to, uh, to analyze what we see in the observation because this uh, positive vorticity pattern is, associ is associated with the cyclonic circulation like here and an anti-cyclonic circulation like here. And this is what we see in the surface currents. 
we see a swirl of the current in this way and another one in that way. So this is really, it matches quite well with the result that we have from, from the, the model. And it, it means that we can, use, we can use our model to try to understand and, and, um, and study these type of processes. Oh, sorry. Oh. So this is the second site that we sampled along the Cuban coast. So it's uh, the western tip of Cuba here, and there's the Gulf of Guanajaca Bibes here. So this is in ocean color. It's very, very intense in, in terms of chlorophyll content, very rich waters. And if I change the color scale here, this is the Gulf. So it's not land. Here's the Gulf, very rich waters. And we sample just outside of it. Because, yeah, it's very shallow, we were not allowed to, to get in. And this is the surface current that we encountered. So it's dominantly here to the northeast because the loop current, as we saw, was retracted and was really was pushed really close to the Cuban coast. And so the dominant current was really northeastward following the loop current. But then looking really at the, in this transect, really close to the shore here, we saw again in the, in the vertical section of offshore current a uh, Napoleon cell with uh, offshore current on the top and onshore current at the at the bottom. So this is again a, yeah, typical of, of upwelling and this is an area that we see many many times filaments and most of the time much larger than the one that we sampled here. So for example in the previous cruise in 2015 the same bluefin tuna cruise, I mean the bluefin tuna cruise from the, the fisheries uh, lab, the and they were in different condition at that time with an extended loop current. This is altimetry. So in red is uh, the loop current, typical extended loop current with associated with the anticyclonic signature that we see in surface currents. And now if we look at ocean color, we see a, a very large filament that is originating from this area offshore, the Gulf, and that is untrained by the cyclonic circulation on the western side of the loop current, which means that whatever material is untrained can potentially, potentially reach the center of the Gulf and the, the Northern Gulf following the loop current. So this is a zoom and we see like yeah, typically the, the filament that we sampled this year in 2016 are about this size but larger filaments also happen in, in that area. So now the last part of my talk. So I'm going to talk about the Flower Garden Banks in the National Marine Sanctuary, which is a little away from the loop current, so yeah, not exactly in the same system. But um, it's an interesting case because it was affected this summer by an intense mortality event that affected the corals over there. So again, the Flower Garden Banks uh, Sanctuary is located here, so it's really offshore. Uh, it's underwater, like 20 to 100 meter depth. These are the, the bathymetry of both. There are two sites, east and west, flower garden banks. And um, as I said, the, the, the sanctuary experienced a very intense mortality event uh, that was observed, uh, reported late July, which was very localized only on the eastern, uh, on the eastern reef of the, of the sanctuary and in the shallow parts of that area. So it's a bit questioning and no, the NOAA people that are managing the, the sanctuary were really, are really nervous to, to yeah, understand what's going on. And so as part of our restore project with uh, Frank Miller-Karger and uh, Vili Kouafalu here, um, we, yeah, we decided to tackle the question and try to understand what happened, what, are, what were the conditions, the oceanic conditions that prevailed at the moment, at that time of the mortality event. So again, we looked at the first things we had at our hands were, was uh, ocean color and altimetry. So initially in June, so this is uh, yeah, ocean color and altimetry, so anti-cyclonic loop current eddy here, and here typically a cyclonic eddy. So the flower garden banks is located here. So it's the two magenta points, I hope you all see them. So initially in June, we see quite large signature of high chlorophyll coastal waters along the northwestern Gulf and Texas coast, coast. And in June, there was a quite rapid extension of that patch that was initially along the coast, 
first southeastward and to the point that it reaches the flower garden banks probably around late June. And in July, we saw again um, the continued extension of these patches of high chlorophyll waters, and, but that was more in the, in the shape of a shift of the high uh, concentration waters from the coast offshore. And finally, so during that time, the flower garden banks was where um, the century was under the influence of these coastal waters. And we see finally in, um, in late July, a cyclonic eddy that was located here that is able to untrain filaments of uh, high chlorophyll content water from the shelf offshore. And we see its filament going down in the middle of the Gulf. So it's originating from the Gulf and, and reaching far originating from the coast and, and reaching down far uh, offshore. So to summarize the, these findings with ocean color, this is uh, maps this time of, of uh, anomalies in chlorophyll content from weekly estimates. So we see what I was mentioning initially in June, along the coast is very intense anomaly that spreads rapidly offshore in mid-June. And in July, we see a shift of this high uh, chlorophyll content waters to the point that the anomaly at the coast at that time is, is negative, like the high chlorophyll content waters were moved offshore in the middle of the, of the shelf. And the end result is that the flower garden uh, banks here was under the influence of these coastal waters for weeks and weeks. And so this type of, of spread is typical of shelf processes, not so much of, of uh, deep ocean mesoscale. So, again, another estimate is the time series of the chlorophyll anomaly experience at the, at the bank. So, in solid line is the average, weekly average of this chlorophyll anomaly in orange on the eastern uh, banks and on the, in blue on the western uh, banks, on the western reef. And they are both quite similar, but in dashed line are the values, the maximum value experience based on, on, on uh, satellite imagery. And we see that this for this estimate, the, the eastern uh, reef, which is the one that experienced the mortality even, was the one with the strongest signature in terms of, of chlorophyll anomaly. So what can cause this um, huge uh, amount of, of coastal water spreading on the shelf? So we looked at river discharge, and we see that the Mississippi system um, discharge in 2016 was really close to the, its uh, climatological values. but if we consider only the rivers on the northwestern uh, Gulf of Mexico, we see that the, the anomaly of, for 2016 was huge due to the very intense uh, rain and flooding event that, we, that happened in Texas in spring that we heard in the news. There were um, uh, yeah, very intense flooding and this, of course these waters end up in, uh, in the Gulf of Mexico. So we see like, repeated episodes of very, very, very large discharge uh, along the north, northwestern Gulf this year. Associated with that are uh, wind patterns. So I'm showing here the wind vectors at two locations, one here close to the Mexican border and one here close to Galveston. And we see that in June, there were mid-June, there was a, a big episode, an episode of intense northward uh, winds. And in Galveston, this winds was more uh, north uh, eastward, which means more aligned with the coast. And this type of winds is favorable for upwelling. And more importantly, in early July, there's a very, very um, marked episode of north, northward, uh, you know, southerly winds along the coast and southwesterly winds in Galveston area. So those two episodes were really favorable for upwelling and offshore uh, transport of, of coastal waters. If we look at the SST maps for this, uh, this period, we see initially uh, quite cool SST all over the shelf, but at the moment, in mid-June, at the moment of the um, upwelling event that I mentioned, we see that the salinity, the temperature, sorry, is um, is low along the coast, and and this low, which is typical of upwelling, and but this uh, upwelling signature go, goes as far as uh, Galveston Bay, which means that the whole coast experience offshore um, offshore transport, and this signature is even more marked in mid-July. Um, with a very, yeah, very, very strong upwelling signal, which is associated with the shift in surface waters that, that we, we 
observed in, in ocean color. So we were uh, lucky enough to have in-situ data not in July, unfortunately, during the peak of the event, but the, in June during the hypoxia cruise that was led by Kim Johnson across the street at, at NOAA Fisheries. And um, so those are the, all the points that were sampled during June, starting June 10 till the end of the month. And um, we looked at those, uh, those in-situ sampling to try to uh, understand what was the vertical structure of the, of the waters at that time. So I'm showing only one section that is located here. And on top is in colors is salinity with the black contours in temperature. So we see the uh, low salinity waters at the surface uh, extending offshore. And the other graph is the, in colors is the oxygen content, and in black contours is uh, the density contours. So we see that below this surface low salinity waters of river origin, there is a, a minimum in oxygen, which is expected in uh, hypoxic conditions such as the northern gulf in summer, but usually hypoxic waters are sitting on the at the bottom, but here it's a mid-depth layer that is extending offshore following the isopycnal contours. So this is a process that has been reported recently that has happened in the past, but we see it happening this year on very large scale, and um, it was able to extend quite far offshore. Not when in the data we have it has not reached yet the flower garden banks, but we we suspect that this type of processes have was able to reach that area. So if I summarize that study case, uh, specific uh, flower garden banks study case, we saw very large river discharge in spring that, um, that led to the, yeah, uh, the formation of large quantities of, of, uh, of uh, river waters uh, along the coast of the Northwestern Gulf. And there were the, those coastal waters spread in two episodes, one in mid-June and more importantly, one in, in July where the these coastal waters were spread all over the shelf and, and um, advected over the flower garden banks area. And we saw uh, the presence of a mesoskeleton which was able to trap some of these uh, river waters from the shelf edge down to the, to the center of the gulf, but this is not the main uh, process probably responsible for the mortality event that we saw. And we saw on the in-situ data the presence of uh, low oxygen uh, at mid-depths uh, just below the surface layer that, it were, that are advected quite far offshore. So we suspect it is associated with the mortality event. We are not sure yet. It's a work in progress. We are talking with, with NOAA people there, but we have yeah, good, uh, um, yeah, we are, we have, it's a strong hypothesis that this type of, of neapoxic conditions were was able to, to reach the flower garden banks and it forms filaments. I, I didn't show the other uh, transect, but so we see that in some transects and not others. So that suggests very uh, yeah, filamentation, so very intense but localized signature, which, which might explain why the mortality event was uh, localized in, in one of the reef and, and not the other. So yeah, we're writing, uh, we are working on, on the manuscript right now to explain those, those features that I just explained. And to conclude more generally in the, in about the Gulf of Mexico uh, loop current system, and so I showed in this talk that you know, the loop current determines uh, connectivity patterns at the scale of the, of the Gulf. So when it's extended, it's able to typically uh, advect waters from the Mississippi Delta from the Northern Gulf down to the Florida Straits. And when it's retracted, um, the connectivity patterns are uh, concerned the Campeche Bank down to the Florida Straits area. And in both cases, mesoskeletons play a role either in um, um, advecting material onshore or offshore or more indirectly by uh, modifying the, the extension of the loop current and its pathway. And uh, which is the case for, which is the case typically for a retracted loop current. It's the, uh, loop current frontal eddy that is blocking the extension of, of the loop current that is playing a, a key role. Oh, wait. Wow, that was weird. So uh, we are currently working on characterizing those, uh, those episodes 
and um, we're interested in studying the impact that these uh, export episodes can have on local ecosystem in the Florida Keys. So that's our current restore project uh, I'm working on. And we're also interested in the impact of these uh, connectivity patterns on the, the transport of, of fish larvae and how they, they affect regional and local connectivity. So we have submitted a, a proposal to the last restore call for proposal in collaboration with the, uh, John Lampkin's lab at the fisheries. And uh, also the high resolution Gulf of Mexico model that we have already set up is, uh, is able to reproduce those, uh, those uh, connectivity pathways. So it's a very great tool to work with. Um, in addition to this uh, results, so I, I presented results from the, from the bluefin tuna uh, cruise from 2016. So we were lucky uh, to sample a loop current frontal lady, which uh, are, I've been working on this, this type of processes for years. So I, it was great to be able to sample them and characterize them and show that they are, uh, we were able to show that they have a very deep signature, deeper than what was thought before. And we also have the drifted data that, that I just showed the trajectories, but more work is required to really get a sense of the, the changes in, in the vorticity, in the dynamical patterns, how this, how this eddy has evolved in the, first, in the few weeks that we had a, a drifter inside it. That's uh, yeah, very interesting work to do. And uh, finally, we were able to sample uh, coastal upwelling systems along Cuba at two locations, and they're are very, uh, we see them a lot on ocean color imagery, but they are very poorly studied. So we, the data that we collected are very precious to characterize these features. And um, also the model that, the high resolution model is also able to represent those processes. So that's also a very uh, uh, promising uh, research area to understand the, the, the coastal processes along Cuba. So with this, I will thank you all. I will, yeah. I'm... <laughs> um, yeah, I was willing to say that uh, um, it's very uh, exciting. I mean, we have been here encouraged to collaborate more with the uh, um, people across the street to look at the interaction between the physics and the biology. And this is uh, this has been happening in the past few months at a yeah very. Um, yeah, high level, I think, and um, in, uh, I'm, I'm very excited to, to, to take part in this type of, of work, and uh, yeah, I think it's a great moment. Thank you. I will take any question. Yeah, yeah very interesting talk. Thank uh, you. I am curious to know what happens in the north part of the world when there is no intrusion of the North Korean. Mm -hmm. water from so when there is when the loop current is extended? No, when it's not extended. So the, the water from Campeche goes mm -hmm. south or they can also reach some part of the north It's um, it can it usually follows the extended loop current. The loop current usually is more extended that that the condition that we experienced last spring. So it's usually, it will usually go go north, like here. There, will, there is often a filament that is following the edge of the loop current, like here. So it's, here is pretty marked, but it's, it's not always as intense, but it's... Well, it follows the loop, the loop current, but it's not, it's not always very marked. So that's, there's also a variability in the intensity of the signal, but that's the usual uh, the, the, yeah, the usual pathway is here, but we, that also requires, I guess, favorable conditions on the Campeche bank itself, because it's not always observed. But usually it would go here rather than here, but both pathways are possible. So then in the Mississippi River, uh, can be more affected in, in summertime, the transport of the Mississippi? From the Mississippi? Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's usually uh, because the the large discharge are in spring, and usually the loop current is extended in summer. Not always, but tends to be. So that's yeah, in summer when that's when we when we tend to see the, this uh, this Mississippi River uh, export episodes.
Lou? Um, for the Mississippi event where you looked at the rural water that wasn't associated with rainfall, right? The first one in 2014, there was no flooding of the of the Mississippi River, so it was there was no extra water put in the in the Gulf, so it's very like yeah, it's it's dominated by the dynamics, like the the winds that were pushing that were pushing those waters constantly to the east, and there's an yeah, an interaction with with the local mesoscale also because there was one uh, uh, the loop current eddy, the the cyclonic anticyclonic loop current eddy that was there was had a had a weird eastward extension that keep pushing the waters along the shelf edge and then they they were advected along the shelf edge. So yeah, that's really, uh, uh, that was dominated by, by dynamics at that time. Lou? Uh, thank you, that was a great talk. Thank you. Uh, incredible. It still amazes me that you got through that in 40 minutes. That's pretty good. Uh, yeah. Thank you. Um, I have a zillion questions, but uh, the simplest one was that it looked as though a lot of the the filament features that you were reproducing, mm -hmm. you were actually reproducing uh, the front of Genesis well in the model. You mean the, the, at the, in the wake of the islands? No, not the island wakes, although those were nice. Yeah. Um, yeah along the northern, along, along northern. Coherent boats and vortices coming off, but mm -hmm. in the, the filaments that you were using as ocean color to track, uh, it looked as though the model was actually reproducing the filament structure nicely, which was surprising. And that implies that your model is reproducing some key aspect of the front, the front of the island. Yeah, that's that's something I was curious to check. To yeah, I was surprised also. And that's I mean, I was that's something I got while I was preparing this talk, so I didn't get into much details for what the model is able to reproduce. But that was yeah, that was a very nice surprise when I I saw those features in, in relative vorticity. I thought that yeah, I was that was very relevant. Sorry, sorry. Uh, wait, wait, wait. This one. Yeah, we, we see this filament forming, but yeah, really the, the shape and the size of the features really match uh, what what we were able to see here. We, do, we don't see the anticyclonic part here, but the, the curvature of the current is very, really matches what, what we were able to infer from the model simulation. So that's, and actually, yeah, that's, that's something, like when we saw the currents here, I, I couldn't figure out what was going on because it's going all over the place, it's going south and then north and then south. It's moving like that. And then I heard that we had ADC issues with the ADCP that Ryan after the cruise tour, uh, the second leg like two or three, you, you guys had, had huge problems with the ADCP. And when, when you, you told me, oh, the ADCP is, is, is off, uh, it probably was not working well in the first leg. Like, oh, yeah, that makes sense. Probably that's why we have those crazy things. But no, those things were real. And then this is the data that, that Ryan gave me from the, the clean data that he was able to retrieve. And yeah, it's, it's very it's consistent with the uh, very local uh, coastal processes along north, northern Cuba. So. Follow-up question, since you seem to be doing that well, it would be really easy to do. I mean, filaments are very easy to track with. Um, so yeah, that's that's primarily. You can actually do climatologies of front presence, absence, front location. Yeah, that seems that seems doable. We have to well, this, but then we have to estimate how accurate the model is on the long run because we have one case here, and that is that matches well. But yeah, we have to make sure that it's it's a consistent, uh, um, realistic representation. But yeah, that's a direction to follow clearly. Any question? Okay, thank you.